you had no indications of hypothyroidism in terms of the reports. So you have decent levels of T3, T4, high levels even. So all of that's awesome. But I did see a couple of nutrition, yeah, and, and yeah, underactive thyroid. So you don't have any of the risk factors for thyroid issues. But you do have a couple of nutritional needs, which if they were not met, could lead to thyroid issues. So yeah, you have an and just to clarify, that doesn't mean that she's deficient when you say that, but based on her genetics, no. she would have a tendency to require more of that nutrient, I think is exactly. what you were saying. Exactly, yes. And obviously, if you meet that, then you don't have a problem, as you say, Michael. I'm Dr. Michael Haley. And in this episode, if you're listening only, you might want to check out the video version because I'm meeting with Elwin Robinson to go over a DNA test results using his website where the reports are available. As we go through and look at some of the more likely to be expressed genes and what you can do about it, it makes a lot more sense when you see the report. The whole purpose of meeting with Elwin to begin with was to find out more about the DNA test and what we could learn from it. And if you had listened to that episode, I kind of said, you might want to wait before purchasing this if you're thinking about getting a DNA test. Let's see what it's all about and find out whether or not I even think it's beneficial. After this recording with Elwin, I find it fascinating and very insightful and something that could be used to focus real laboratory tests, what kind of blood tests I might want to get, for instance, following the reading of DNA results. So with that in mind, I recommend if you're listening only to check out the video portion if you're really interested in this topic. You'll get a lot from listening. You can imagine us viewing reports, scrolling through them, but it's a screen capture that he is sharing with us as we go over Michelle's results. Not all of them, only some of them. There were a lot of reports based on this one test. This is the Dr. Haley Show podcast, and we're revisiting Elwin Robinson, who has genetic insights dot, is it dot co? Yes, thank you geneticinsights.co and Michelle had taken the genetics test and we are here with Elwin today to go over results and figure out what we learn from this test. And Elwin, before we started recording, this was interesting because you started talking about, well, it's less accurate, but it's not actually less accurate. It's just there's less things to find out when someone is living a real healthy lifestyle, right? Yeah, absolutely. I would say I've done this with quite a few health gurus. Not many of them are willing to do it on the, in front of a camera on a podcast. So I admire your courage, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> um, but I've done it with quite a few. And yeah, the results seem to be less accurate because, of course, we're giving risk factors for various different issues. There's no guarantee that anyone will get any of them. But what I do observe is when someone has a very high percentile risk factor, Usually by the time they're about 40-ish, they either have the problem or they have had the problem. But the one exception to that is people like yourselves who are highly committed to health and who really look after themselves. But what I do see there is quite often maybe we'll look at the recommendations and we'll notice that the, per the person doesn't have the problem that they have a high likelihood of getting, but they have quite likely been following many of the recommendations for a long time. And so I guess you could say it's still accurate in that sense. Yeah, so and making more sense out of that, if there's a genetic predisposition towards a certain cancer, that doesn't mean you're going to get that cancer. There are certain things that will activate the gene or what, deactivate, put it to sleep. I don't know how yeah. you, what the proper terminology is. And if we're living that lifestyle that already kind of makes that gene unable to reveal itself, then we're not going to see the symptoms. That doesn't change the fact that she might still have that particular gene. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's gene expression. So there's the whole field of epigenetics, and that basically means which of these genetic vari variants are expressed. And so 
I mean, obviously with lifestyle, diet, upbringing, environment, all of those things can change what genes are expressed, as you say, and influence whether a person manifests most of their risk factors or very few. So we still do have a huge level of control over our own health and our own destiny. And of course that's the case. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to give recommendations. Well, the reason we can and do give recommendations is because you can change it. But what you can't change is your innate genetic uh, risk factors like the, uh, the so the SNPs as they're called we talked about that in the last episode you're born with them and you have them throughout your whole life but whether they are being read or expressed or not is a lot of that is down to how healthy you live your life now I am also curious as to what genes were recorded in this test and as an example uh, I believe Friday, I'm going to be meeting with one of your friends that was being tested for possibly having, I'm guessing, the HLA B27 gene, which might predispose them to ankylosing spondylitis. Mm -hmm. In this particular test, are all of those things available to us? Is it one complete test and we're just not necessarily looking at, all, at them all? Would we actually be able to see if she had that particular gene based on the test that we already did? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, it partly depends on what the original uh, data gathering source was. So someone uses Ancestry.com, if someone uses 23andMe, if someone uses MyHeritage. So different companies will test different SNPs to some degree, although there is a lot of overlap between them, which is why we're able to do our service with people who have data from all those different sources. If someone uses our service, then it is a broad variety. Currently, we do not have a report for every single gene because um, there would be thousands, hundreds of thousands. It would be an absolute nightmare to filter the way through. We have recently added a section for genes. Um, and so we have around 80 at the moment of some of the most important ones. And so you can see we do have some of the HLA variants uh, here, Michael. Okay. Like we have HLA DQ. Uh, that's the only one that thinks that, oh, HLA DQA2. So there's a few of them actually that Michelle has a, a suboptimal snip in let's put it that way but uh i don't think we have the specific one you mentioned in this list we don't have a specific report dedicated to it however i don't think we hmm. i'll have to check if uh, i'm not sure if we have a report on alkalizing spondylitis but if we did then we would pull up the report for that and then it would give her a risk score of that, not just based on that one gene, but based on a bunch of different genes and it would list them on one of the pages of the report so for most of the reports, so this is a list of genes, but most of the reports, if I pull up another random one, like say digestive health, we can see there's nausea, peptic ulcers, leaky gut, that kind of stuff. So if we were to pull up one of those, in fact, shall I just pull up one so sure. I can um, give an example? So let's pull up a really broad one, like low mood, I noticed. So, and um, the good news for Michelle on this one, is that you do not have a tendency for a low mood, which I think is what we have to call it, but really it's depression. Um, so there's not a strong genetic tendency for depression, which is great. You can see you're on the lower percentile for that. And so you can see that there is a bunch of genes here, Michael, uh, that we've listed. Um, and then there are some of them that are uh, the variants which are more high risk that are listed here. So when it's listed as red here, it means that you that is the high risk SNP. But overall, you can see here, it says it's based on 84,205 genetic variants. So we've just listed the top most relevant 20 that Michelle has some kind of important variant here. But do you see what I mean? So this assessment of the risk of depression is based on a huge amount of factors like if we were to list all of those genes you you'd never finish scrolling right if, if that makes sense it does yeah i understand so taking a step back and just looking at this we're saying okay based on this there's a low predisposition towards depression yes but if it was higher then we'd probably be looking at saying okay so what are the things that we can do in our lives to balance that and stop these genes from expressing themselves. 
Absolutely. And if you want to carry on with that um, theme, as you were, so even though I don't see a high risk for depression, I do see a higher risk for uh, mood swings, which is more just a mood being up and down. Um, you're <laughs> oh, that doesn't with... happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, so at your worst, Michelle, I would doubt that you would be someone who would struggle to get out of bed because you're so depressed and life is meaningless and all that kind of stuff. But you may be a bit up and down sometimes. Um, according to this so and uh, and i say a bit i mean wow. you can see here we can't always 83rd is not bad i mean 98th to 99th means that there's a very strong chance that you will have a fairly strong version of it uh, unless you are really on top of um all the recommendations that we give you can see here it says up to 80 percent of differences in people's chance of developing bipolar type of symptoms are down to genetics so there's quite a strong genetic some things is only 10 or 20 percent genetic uh, like genetics only pay, play a ve fairly small role in whether you have that thing manifest and sometimes genetics play a fairly big role in this case it's a fairly big role but as i said it's not like the highest percentile so you're in the top 20 percent something like that if it were much lower then you'd be in the mid-range so i wouldn't expect this to be severe based on what we're seeing here but uh i don't know is that does that resonate at all is there a little bit of tendency for ups and downs we we eat well and we do yoga and play pickleball. <laughs> mm -hmm. So is that a no? <laughs> what was the question? I said, is there a little bit of a tendency for ups and downs emotionally? Almost oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And my mom um, was bipolar. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, so then that's actually good news that even though it's been passed along to some degree, it's not severe I, I, I guess that you've inherited your dad's tendency as well to not have it to some degree does that yeah. make sense yeah a lot of sense awesome okay so that's good but yeah you can see i mean there's a big list here of uh let's see yeah there's we're evaluating 1 million uh, genes wow. so we're we're evaluating a lot of genes to come to this conclusion so the fact that this top 20 here are all red doesn't mean that all million are red it's just that those are the ones we selected for people like yourself michael who do want to look at specific individual genes you can then look up the individual genes mm -hmm. um and so it gives more information obviously all about bipolar then michelle but for those people who are not as aware who get one of these reports it kind of explains it a little bit and so it talks about risk factors childhood bullying and stress and all that kind of stuff and then it gives recommendations and so uh you can see the recommendations here are um there's a couple of things about them so first of all the order of the recommendations is specifically based on your genetics so if someone else had this report they might have similar recommendations say if michael did it as well but he wouldn't have it in the same order does that make sense yeah uh, often the, the ones with the most evidence that will be high up so you might both have psychotherapy up because as you're probably aware that is very important when you have bipolar that you, you have a mental health professional who can help you with that it's obviously not the only thing but it's certainly helpful so you can see also do you see here it says impact and evidence and it has little numbers next to it yeah so what that means so impact is how effective is that likely to be based on all the evidence and then evidence is how much evidence is there that it's effective and so you can see five out of five there's a lot of evidence that psychotherapy helps with bipolar or just mood swings and there's it has a, a high impact maybe not as high as we'd like it to be obviously but it's still high we don't give drug recommendations uh, obviously maybe they would have five out of five certain drugs are very helpful for people who actually have bipolar which of course you don't um so they recommend psychotherapy you can see all the did you see the little r's here with the the in the blue writing so these are all references scientific references you could click on any one of them and it would link to a study oh, that's interesting. So, yeah. okay so yeah. for people that are getting these reports they can actually see what that's what that recommendation is based on scientifically absolutely and so like i said a lot of people ask me is this something i could show to my medical doctor and i say well i've i've dealt with medical doctors where they won't even listen to what other medical doctors have to say so obviously it depends on how open they are but if they're a medical doctor who cares about evidence but they they have to have facts to back it up right they don't want to hear anything woo woo i would say in my experience is a genetic insights report is a pretty good 
an open-minded doctor will accept it because of you know every single thing that we say here is uh very highly based on science and very highly cited as well the, you can see there's pretty much no sentence here that that doesn't have numerous citations and so next recommendation avoiding substance abuse um again that's probably pretty obvious to anyone who knows about bipolar but that's an important thing to recommend uh, exercising just talks yeah, about I, doing I, yoga i can't i i try to get her to abuse some substances with me but she won't. <laughs> just aloe vera right <laughs> exercise 30 minutes a day she's probably up to two hours a day wow maybe more well she's a yoga teacher so she's exercising in the mornings at, at it's funny because you talk about on, on the report you said it's probably not difficult for her to get out of bed in the morning Mm -hmm. No, not even at 4 a.m. because she's in the garage by 4.30 a.m. doing <laughs> yoga and working out before she goes to work to do more. That's fantastic. Uh, wow. It, it, uh, it's so neat. We actually see some real life uh, correlation between yeah. genetics and very, very neat. Mm -hmm. We could go to another report because you're obviously on top of this, but I'll just skim through them. So sleeping for seven plus hours, obviously when you're sleep deprived. Those symptoms are more likely to show up. Relaxation techniques, you're just talking about yoga, sunlight. I mean, a lot of this right. is, I guess, common sense stuff, but that's it's common sense because it's true, right? And it's helpful and not everyone does this stuff. So it's still very important that we recommend all this stuff because it is what makes the most difference. Some other slightly more less obvious ones, I guess, like cycling. I guess there's been a bunch of studies done that show that it helps with uh, staving off bipolar, specifically morning light. Uh, swimming, walking. So you can see there's not a lot of supplement recommendations here. Oh yeah, there's the first one. Okay, omega-3. There's more a lot of healthy lifestyle recommendations, which I'd say is true. That That is the first thing I would recommend a client who wanted help with that. Probably you'd say the same, Michael. Yeah, it, it's neat because we, and, and she more than me, just inherently does these things, whether it's walking or getting sunlight and making vitamin D. <laughs> It's we part of our lifestyles. More. We should walk for. Maybe I won't be so moody. <laughs> <laughs> you can walk and I'll skateboard next to you. How's that? <laughs> or cycle. Um, so there's so many different topics or categories that we can look at that we could go 10 hours or whatever. I know we yeah. have limited time. Is okay. there anything that you're specifically hormonal interested balance. in? Let's look at hormonal okay. balance. <laughs> awesome. Let's look at that. Sorry. So there are... I, I include some, obviously all the hormones are in here and I include some other things that I feel are very relevant to hormones, like fatigue, for instance, because that can obviously, um, uh, skew hormones. And then I include a couple of nutrients as well. Like I, I put selenium in here because thyroid hormone is one of the most important hormones. And when people have a tendency to need more selenium, they often get depleted and then they are more likely to have uh, hypothyroid issues potentially. I did actually see, I think I remember, yeah, you, you, you had no indications of hypothyroidism in terms of the reports. So you have decent levels of T3, T4, high levels even. So all of that's awesome. But I did see a couple of nutrition, yeah, and, and yeah, underactive thyroid. So you don't have any of the risk factors for thyroid issues, but you do have a couple of nutritional needs, which if they were not met, could lead to thyroid issues. So yeah, you have an and just to clarify, that doesn't mean that she's deficient when you say that, but based on her genetics, no. she would have a tendency to require more of that nutrient, I think is exactly. what you were saying. Exactly. Yes. And obviously if you meet that, then you don't have a problem as you say, Michael, but yeah. So that's another category we can look at nutrient needs. Like we have literally for every single nutrient, we have a report on it, but yeah, just a couple of them that are relevant to hormones. So there was increased need for selenium an increased need for iodine. And also I remember from the nutrients report an increased need for tyrosine, which is the amino acid that the body makes thyroid hormone out of. So the fact, uh, uh, have you ever had your fire tested or have you had it tested recently? Is it, I'm assuming it's healthy. I'm just asking. I can't remember. Well, I, I do recall that when you've been the tested, everyone said that, well, you're off the charts of perfection. Like everything is perfect. Okay, um, great. So, so excellent. So yeah, I, I assume that's because you're eating a highly nutritious diet. And so even though you have an increased need for those few nutrients, you're meeting it, right? But for someone who is eating a very nutritionally deficient diet, which is it's easy to be depleted in selenium, it's easy to be 
depleted in iodine if you eat a poor diet, then it could develop hyperthyroidism even though you don't, you know, have a genetic tendency for it. Does that make sense? A lot yeah, of yeah, sense. Yeah. Okay, awesome. But yeah, anyway, so thyroid is great. Um, you had an interesting one here. So a tendency for lower levels of leptin. Uh, leptin, some people believe that leptin is like the master controlling hormone of the body that it influences all the other hormones. Are you one of those people, Michael? You seem like you... No, I'm I'm okay, unfamiliar okay. with it. When okay. I saw the well, word leptin, I was trying to recall what that was after 25 years of being out of school. No worries. Leptin is the satiety hormone. So leptin is usually balanced with ghrelin. Leptin is the I've had enough, and then ghrelin is the I'm hungry. So leptin is often implicated in people who overeat or struggle to lose weight. Um, and so the fact that you have lower levels of leptin uh, could indicate the possibility that you would overeat, but for some reason it's not in here, sorry. But you also actually have lower levels of ghrelin. So I've never actually seen that combination before. You have lower levels of both of them. So I, I would imagine that they cancel themselves cancel themselves out. I mean, would you say you have a tendency to overeat or undery or are you right in the middle? Only because we're really good cooks. <laughs> we know how to do we know how to do food and you just can't stop. I do have a tendency to probably eat more than i should when something is too good <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, but you're not eating enough to make you overweight right that's quite obvious no so yeah yeah I so, uh, so. No, definitely not no no, no <laughs> exactly i mean i can see <laughs> that's pretty <laughs> i, I that's a... i'm guilty of that but <laughs> <laughs> not her <laughs> that's an easy one to evaluate we are interrupting this podcast to share this month's coupon for five percent off site-wide on halonutrition.com just use the coupon code MARCH2024. That's M-A-R-C-H-2024 with no spaces for an extra 5% off site-wide on HaleyNutrition.com now through the end of March 2024. Combine this coupon with bundle items to maximize your savings. Now, back to the show. So, yeah, I would say you had a couple of things that may mean, meant genetically that you could have a tendency for increasing weight, but you also had a couple of things meant that you didn't. So I, I guess that those had, had balanced themselves out. So high levels of pregnenolone, that's a good thing. So pregnenolone is right at the top of the cascade of steroid hormones. So your body starts with cholesterol, which it turns into pregnenolone. It turns pregnenolone into progesterone and cortisol, and then it turns those into DHEA and it turns those into testosterone and estrogen and so a lot of people have a problem doing that conversion from cholesterol to pregnenolone which then means that they have two problems they have too much cholesterol which often the doctor tells them about but the other problem which the doctor often doesn't tell them about is that they have a lack of those sex hormones and I don't see a tendency for low level of any of the sex hormones where are the sex hormones well they're not at the top oh, the here because then because you don't have high risk i was going to say except for the estradiol yeah, yeah that's the only one you have a tendency for low levels of have you had that tested yeah I don't is it low we did it at life extensions hmm. mm -hmm. it was very low okay well here's the interesting thing this is a little bit controversial but a few decades ago doctors were giving a lot of women um estrogen right like premarin specifically and there was this idea that estrogen was the female hormone and that it was good and you mentioned cancer earlier i mean the higher your estrogen estrogen is a major contributor to all kinds of cancer in both men and women and especially women and so when i come across someone who estrogen is low especially uh, and their progesterone is good and again your progesterone has a uh, at least a genetic tendency to be good to be oh no sorry yeah no sorry that was low as well my apologies i misremembered that so yeah you have a tendency to have low progesterone as well so long as those two are balanced against each other it's not such an issue but i would be more concerned with low progesterone if anything i would okay. personally not be concerned with low estrogen how do you feel about that michael well i i just want to reiterate for people listening this does not mean her levels are low because you would have to test to validate that. This means yes. we'd have a predisposition towards lower levels. That's what yes. we're getting out of the genetic testing. Yes, I was just commenting because she just said that they were low when she tested them. Um, yeah, right, right. Yeah. So I would not worry about that being low if you tested the estrogen personally. Um, 
but I would be interested in maybe increasing progesterone if that was low with blood testing. And I'd be interested in testing it periodically to make sure oh. that, it, that it wasn't low. Progesterone is a very okay. important hormone for men no, and women. And I want, I, want women. To, I want to just reiterate, just for people listening, so they're not confused. You would mean it would be, it would be good to retest you for that hormone, not genetic test, because the genetic test does not change. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, progesterone is a very important hormone. I, I didn't actually download this, but we can download it. It usually takes a minute for all kinds of reasons, but it's a very powerful anti-stress hormone. Um, it's the primary anti-stress hormone in women. So the primary anti-stress hormone in men is testosterone. Um, it, progesterone lowers cortisol and it stimulates GABA. And and so if you're, if you're feeling low stress already, then great. Um, I wouldn't worry about progesterone, even if it is low in a blood test. But if you did want to lower stress and your progesterone is low, um, it's something you can maybe look at with a doctor who specializes in it. But obviously, as I say, I, I'm not commenting on what you should do about it. I'm just saying there is that genetic tendency as you're interested in hormones. That would be the one that I would be most keen to test to oh. validate. Yeah, you know, this sense. is really neat because what we have is we have a test that kind of tells us what we should test for. <laughs> because... <laughs> because you could go it can around. It's really expensive, right? Like doing these blood tests can be very expensive and they can take a long time to get results. A lot of people don't want to get blood drawn. So, yeah, it helps to narrow it down. That's pretty cool. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to see it. I'm, I, I wasn't sure why we did this test to begin with, but now I'm understanding. <laughs> awesome. Which is good. The other one that you have a tendency to be low is growth hormone. Um, this is not, again, not necessarily a bad thing, just like I said with estrogen. And yes, Michael, <laughs> it doesn't mean it's necessarily low, but it means it could be if you test for it. I don't know if I would spend the money to bother testing to see if it's low, though. The, some of the main benefits of growth hormone and reason that people like it to be high is because when your growth hormone is high, your body tends to put on muscle but shed fat. That's usually why people boost their growth hormone. As you already have good muscle and low fat, I wouldn't personally worry about it and I wouldn't bother testing it. Um, high growth hormone levels are also potentially a, a bad thing because growth hormone stimulates all kinds of growth, including bad growth that you don't want, like tumors and stuff like that. So having a genetic tendency to have low growth hormone is not necessarily actually a bad thing at all. So even though we've put it as red there, it's lower levels, um, I, I would add that nuance with both of those that they're not necessarily a bad thing if that makes sense yeah what about and, the one next to it the dopamine one yeah so this is actually a gene let's download that one and we'll look at that one um so this is this means that you have a tense so actually let's look at the report because i just wanted to comment on this one as well quickly this dht so dht is the primary androgenic hormone and androgen means male uh, sexual hormonal traits and so again having low levels of that as a woman is not a bad thing at all high levels of dht <laughs> would lead to more facial hair and stuff oh. like that so yeah i i, I want that I would... one. <laughs> <laughs> so almost every hormone that we've talked about here that you have a tendency to be low i actually personally wouldn't be concerned about um i also wouldn't be concerned about high pregnant alone and I would only be concerned about lower levels of leptin if it led to weight gain, which it doesn't seem to in your case. So the only one that I would want to test for, like I said, would be the progesterone because progesterone is so important to have reduced stress. Mm. And speaking of stress, yeah, let's talk about this one. But uh, I think I have another one to look at first. One second. Yeah, dopamine. Let's have a look at the dopamine one while we wait for that to load. So are you familiar with dopamine? Yes. Awesome. Okay. So dopamine is, just for the viewers, is the one of the primary feel-good neurochemicals. Um, and it's the thing that gives you motivation. And so, yeah, you do have a little bit of a tendency for uh, lower dopamine. But I think this is actually balanced out by the other one that we're going to look at in a minute. Uh, so the the potential downside of that is that you will do things to uh, stimulate dopamine. 
So people with low dopamine are not necessarily people who are unmotivated, but often they will do things to stimulate dopamine more than people who have naturally high dopamine. So they're more likely to engage in addictive behaviors, which could be bad addictions, but it could also be positive addictions. So an example of a positive dopamine thing is goal setting, right? Or achievements, hitting sales targets, hitting uh, whatever, any kind of goal, right? But one thing about it is that there's a bit of a tendency towards more of an addictive personality. So a bit less easygoing. I don't know if you could relate to that at all. I can. Okay. Um, so again, not necessarily a bad thing from a you being a successful person point of view, but it can mean that it's a little bit more difficult to relax. Uh, and so, yeah, if we go back to the one you asked about. So this is a particular gene. So there's uh, MAOA and MAOB. Some people have heard of MAO because um, there are a, there's a class of drugs called MAO inhibitors. I don't know if you've heard of those before. Uh, that's quite a more druggy culture, which you guys aren't part of. <laughs> people who do ayahuasca and stuff like that, is, they're into MAO inhibitors. Uh, anyway, uh -huh. so likely higher MAOB activity. Yeah, okay. So again, this does indicate a little a tendency to break down. So basically, this is a gene, right, which relates to an enzyme. And so what enzymes do is they perform chemical processes of transforming one thing into another thing. And so this particular gene, this particular enzyme, takes all the catecholamines, which is dopamine, adrenaline, and noradrenaline, and serotonin, and it converts them into like the next thing. It breaks them down. And so when you have higher MAOB activity, as you do, it just means that you're breaking those feel good, but also stress chemicals down more quickly. And so that indicates sometimes, and I don't think you had a report that indicates it, but it can indicate a little bit of a tendency to ADD kind of thing, like having uh, problems uh, focusing. Now, obviously that can be balanced out by other things. That's only one gene. It's not a full report. But yeah, I don't know. Does that is that accurate at all, or the disagreement there about whether it's accurate? <laughs> no, it all makes a lot of sense, and okay. I'm I'm actually glad he's here and you're reading this because mm -hmm. hopefully it helps him maybe understand who I am a little bit more. It's such a great yeah, point, sure. I, and I I talk about that on interviews a lot, and I think sometimes people don't get it, but I actually think. I've been in the personal development field for years, as I know that you two also are, and self-improvement, all that kind of thing. But for me, the most empowering and profound aspect of all this is actually what you just said, Michelle. It's less about how can I find out my weak spots and my strengths and optimize them, although that's great. I love that. But the very best thing is to do it with other people. I've done it with my friends, my wife, my business partners, and go oh that's why they're like that and to help them understand why i'm like this and then that's why. just just to have that <laughs> just to have that compassion for each other that yeah they're fundamentally different and that's okay and then rather than and, and even for yourself right i've yet, been frustrated right myself now, yet feels like inside <laughs> not validation but i almost feel better in a weird mm -hmm. way about sometimes I don't get things on the computer and I, my attention span on the computer is, it's very short mm -hmm. and his, his brain is like, like that when it comes to the computer. So for me, this makes sense. Hopefully he can be a little more patient <laughs> in, in those areas. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Well, let me go to the brain, brain category health. then as we're, <laughs> as we're talking about that. Yeah. Let's see if that's interesting. Uh, like, gives, gives us anything interesting. Oh yeah, I did download this one already. More likely to be dyslexia. So that could also relate to what you just said. Yeah. No? Well, you're not, you don't really ever show that. You might have no? a okay. position towards it, but you don't see you don't dyslexia. Have that one. Okay, fair enough. And as yeah. I say, I'm pretty sure that the attention one, you actually didn't have it. So, I, yeah, so you don't have a strong tendency towards ADD, but there's just a little bit of the potential of that with the combination of the low dopamine report plus the high MAOB report. So I wouldn't say that it's strong, but I would say it's it's there. I don't, yeah, I mean, 
some of the like headaches i put that under brain health because obviously it's technically usually the brain headache and mononeuropathy that's the type of nerve pain that's relatively rare you would know it if you had that i put hypoglycemia in here because a lot of the time when people have problems concentrating and stuff like that it's actually because they have low blood sugar so we could have a look at this one is that something you can relate to hypoglycemia is that something well, that you're yeah i've heard that throughout my whole life okay from different doctors okay and so different people give different advice for how to deal with that which i won't uh, go into but some people say you should eat regularly right every two to three hours some people yeah. say to do the opposite and do intermittent fasting so different people oh. give different advice but whatever works to balance blood sugar also is really helpful for mood and focus and concentration all the things that we've talked about so far if your blood sugar is stable your energy is stable you, generally your ability to concentrate is also stable uh, so actually that may be a bigger factor towards uh, be, being able to think clearly and, and and feeling as emotionally stable as possible let's see so as i said different people have different opinions about how to deal with it let's see what your genetics say <laughs> and rather than me giving my opinion so first of all you have it here at the top 16 percent so it's fairly high um and as it says it up to 65 percent of differences is due to genetics so it's a it's a fairly strong factor here uh the meaning you may have eaten great your whole life right maybe you never abused sugar or anything like that and yet I still love sugar. okay I, I love well sugar. i'm just saying hypothetically i mean funnily enough you say i love sugar where was it uh, it's one of the first ones i sure there you go sugar cravings yeah more likely to have sugar cravings as well so again you can even blame your genes for that <laughs> <laughs> loving uh so not everyone has a sweet tooth right some people prefer savory i would consider myself one of those people but yes yeah, yeah. yeah yeah but some people do love sweet foods and so obviously that's not a problem from the perspective of weight gain for you but it may be a bit more in the area of hypoglycemia potentially like keeping yeah. your energy stable and balanced just we could just look at that for a second it actually gives some kind of easy recommendations a gymnema is one of them a herb that's a vitamin um, that's a herb oh an herb that helps to uh let's see this it's called it's known as it's known in ayurvedic medicine as the destroyer of sugar because it temporarily reduces the taste of sugar on the tongue well that's interesting hmm. so it could actually um, reduce the effectiveness of sugar at being desirable to you. It also it has been used for, yeah, blood sugar balance. So that might be a good herb for you, especially as it's number one on this list here, despite not being super high impact or evidence. So that's one that you may want to try. And then it gives prunes as well. And then, yeah, most of these recommendations here are very little impact on evidence. I wouldn't pay too much attention to them but that then that genema is probably the only one i'd pay attention to there your number one recommendation uh there's something just to try yeah i think it's a pretty cheap and easily available herb i like how you showed that also how well as far as what to do about it this shows low evidence of impact versus some of the others that have higher evidence of impact with all the references and yeah yeah, and they still have references, but once they have such low evidence, I tend to not focus on them too much personally. They're just there for people who want to do everything. <laughs> so recommendations for hypoglycemia. Let, yeah, let's see. So limit alcohol intake um, up to one drink a day. I imagine you're already following that. Yeah, I don't even drink every day awesome. or every week. Hardly really. ever. Yeah, hardly ever. <laughs> but when up I to... do, I do it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I make up for lost time. <laughs> you and you enjoy, it. enjoy watching other people drink more. Yeah. So like when we watched the video of the two girls falling down the stairs <laughs> <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, and exercise is the other big recommendation that it gives you here. So it doesn't actually give you dietary recommendations. The other big one that it gives is uh, optimizing exercise. Uh, and I think this is... Uh, yeah, because of the uh, a lot of the time it's insulin resistance is a big factor and uh, exercise helps to reduce that. So I think that was probably All why right. there's that recommendation there. So, Owen, one of the things that you said in looking as I'm looking at this page here, you said the reason why I uh, put this one here or something like that. Um, is this a report that you arranged or is it just based on when you... 
Well, when, when someone orders the test that we ordered and we gave you, I think, our username and password, when you log in and scroll up to the top there, there's a drop down window. Mm -hmm. Is that what determines when you choose these things, what's on this page? Or were there certain reports that were already there that might have so been? I, yeah. What, what's someone getting when, when someone gets the test? What are they going to see when they first log in? Sure. Yeah. So this is what you would see. And I've just gone back to browse by category. So this, there's no category there. So there's literally, if you just carry on scrolling, it'd be like over 500 reports. And they're not in a random order, but they're in order. You see here, it says sort by risk. Okay. And then there's a little, so they're sorted by risk score because there's so many and they're a jumble. There's nutrients in there and there's genes and there's risk scores and there's hormones. And like, sometimes it's a bit overwhelming to people. So I usually recommend that they do it by category, like we were doing, like depending on what you're interested in. Okay. You're interested nice. in brain health. You're interested in hormones. Emotional well-being is a popular one. Digestion, nutrient needs is a popular one. You can, uh, for people who don't have any real health issues, you can just see what nutrients you have genetically a tendency to need more of. Um, so that's why I sorted that way. In terms of what I did before and this preparation, Michael, just to explain that, do you see some of them, they say view and some of them say download? Got it. So when that it means says that view, the ones you already downloaded them, got yeah, it. I, I already generated them because it uses up so much processing power. As you see, like just one report is out valuing over a million genes. So they're not all pre-generated because the vast majority of people don't go through all 500 reports. So it just saves computer processing power, honestly. So anything that you're interested in, you click on it. Like if you wanted to know about, uh, I don't know, isoleucine, you click on it and it takes about a minute and then it downloads. And then from then on, you don't have to download it again. You can just click on view and open it in a new window. So yeah, that's, that's the only preparation I did. I have no say in any of the content or any of the recommendations. All of that is auto generated by AI based on the work of a team of several dozen scientists and medical professionals. I don't have any say in that. Literally all I did is generate it. This looks so easy. At first, it was a little overwhelming because there is so much information available there and it mm -hmm. would take a lifetime to go through. But to be <laughs> I don't know about to... that, but it would take a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but to be able to just arrange by risk and then drop down and look at the areas that we're more interested in. I like it. That's, this is really neat. Yeah, I thought it was at first a little hard to read. But then mm. once I started looking at it, and understanding how it worked, it was it was really kind of easy to read. And then the recommendations was my favorite part. Awesome. Oh, you yeah. really had a look at it. That's awesome. Yeah, I had a uh, real good look at it. Fantastic. Right. Well, uh, believe it or not, this is a super simplified version of the original operating system. I, I had that same feeling that you did, Michael. My, my God, this is good, but my God, it's complicated. So this is my attempt to simplify it as much as possible. Um, but it's still, as you say, pretty complex. One of the other things to bear in mind is you guys got the limitless package, which is every report, which is over 500. But a lot of people, they may only go for a collection, like just the hormonal balance or just the nutrient needs. And so then they wouldn't see all these other ones. They'd only see the one that they purchased, which does make it substantially less overwhelming. But a lot of people in the end have, I've noticed more people than I expected have gone for the limitless and they do want absolutely everything, which I do understand because then you can just kind of fish through, right? And, and see what is of most interest to you. Well, if, if we could, and maybe you can open up another tab and show the uh, shop page where we had purchased that limitless package. Yeah, sure. So feel young goes the site. Yeah. So this is uh, the site where the limitless package is sold, but you can see also in this drop down menu on energetic insights, anti-aging, blood sugar, brain health, cardiovascular health. And you can see that those correlate with the categories here. Right. So people can just get one of those categories rather than all of them. Okay. And those are sub substantially cheaper as well. My two goals of this were to take this incredible information and number one, simplify it, as I said, but number two, also make it much more affordable. So for people who just want to know about how they can lose weight or, or brain yeah. health or something like that, it's, it's around 50, $60, some of them but, even less than that. Let's, but let's look at this. If you can go back to that page for a second there. 
Mm -hmm. And um, see where it says products per page 10. Can we drop that uh, down and, and make it like so we can see all of them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, is there a way to sort by price? Probably. Let's see. Yes. High to low or low yeah. to high? So it's it, really not that expensive. When, when you're looking you look at, at this, from my perspective, why not have access? Why not get them all and have access to all of them? Because you're right, I could get in for $65 just looking at this one little profile, but for not much more, we have access to literally everything. And I want I want the people that are listening to this to understand why we would pay more and get them all, and even things we might never look at, but we have them because they're unchanging and they're forever. So yes. And just to explain that, that might seem manipulative, like we're trying to get people to buy that. And I guess there's an element of that. But the truth is, we actually pay a similar amount whether people buy any of them. It's not, it's, um, even though people are getting, what, 20 times as much with the All Access as one of these, it, it doesn't cost us 20 times as much. It costs us about three times as much, which is why we priced it that way. Now, there's also a, t a testing kit, though, to get with that. Yeah, so um, on that original page that you showed us, the sorry that I showed you, the all access page, on that one, it's kind of made very clear. You can either, if you need a DNA kit, you can buy one with, and if you don't need one because you've done twenty three and Me or Ancestry or any of those things before, then you can get it without. If you're getting any of those collections because of the way the Shopify pages work, we weren't able to do it that way every time. But if someone decides to buy one like these anti aging ones, and then they go to check out then it'll just ask them, do you need a DNA kit? And it explains it's only needed if you don't have access to your raw DNA file from another service. So we try to make it as, as simple as possible for people to uh, work it out. Yeah, so that makes perfect sense. And it's compared to what you could be spending on blood testing and doctor's visits, it seems like this can really focus you and say, okay, this is where I should be now getting Absolutely. I, I, I 100% agree with you, Michael. I 100%, thank you. I 100% agree with you that people still need to do a test in a lot of cases. I mean, even with the nutrients, if we just look at that one for a second, in some cases, like for instance, with vitamin A, I personally would not encourage anyone to have extra vitamin A because our genetic test said that a person had increased need, because of course it is possible to have too much vitamin A, right? And we wouldn't ever want to be responsible for someone having too much of a nutrient. In some cases, though, like, and same with iodine, it's very easy to have too much iodine. In some cases, like with vitamin C or some of the amino acids like tyrosine, if people have those, there's really no risk in having more. And so in that case, because it's quite expensive to test, I wouldn't bother testing it. I would just increase it and see if you feel better. Although if you can test, it's always ideal. I like like a Nutrival test where it tests all of the nutrients and all the amino acids, but it's quite expensive. So, I mean, so I'd take that on a case by case basis. And uh, it's yeah, it's the same for a lot of these things. It, it kind of depends on what it is, and because it's hard for people to know that unless they're as immersed in this kind of stuff as you and I, Michael. That's why I'm I'm creating I'm in the process of creating kind of walkthrough videos for each of the categories for people, so it kind of guides them through that. So it's like having a consultation with me, but not like it's free, but it's like a video that guides them through it. But I'm wow. still in the process of creating those. It's kind of it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I want to thank you for the time that you're spending with us here. But that consultation that you mentioned is another option that people have when they get this test that you would actually spend time with them, walking them through their results, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If they're interested in that, as I said, I want to make it as cheap and affordable for people as possible. So it's certainly not required. Everyone can do what as, as you did, Michelle, before this call, they can look through it themselves. And, but if they would like me to walk them through it, I'm happy to. All right. I like it. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Owen, is there, is there anything that you wish we had asked or that you think uh, people listening to this should know about? No, I've, I think it's been fun. I just wish that we had more time to go through it. Maybe we'll do a part two someday because as you see, it's just the tip of the iceberg, right? I right. mean, I don't know how, how much time you spent going through it so far, Michelle, but um, I, I've spent many, many, many hours. I find it fascinating. Uh, I just thank you for the opportunity of sharing it with your people. Yeah, and I, I feel like now we have the the tools, the know how, the understanding to be able to go through those reports. Yeah, and and make sense of it. So to me, this time was so beneficial, and I think it will be to other people that 
are getting the testing and want to be able to look through it and understand what they're looking at. So this is great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right. For those listening, we will put links to the site below the video on YouTube, below the blog posts on the bottom in the resources section on the bottom of the podcast page, look in the resources. You can get connected to Owen through that, through to his websites, geneticinsights.co and feelyounger.net. Net. Great. All right, Owen, thank you so much. Thanks, Owen. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to end with a positive note, and this is a really cool one. So likely higher oxytocin levels. So why this matters is because oxytocin is your, it was the love hormone. So it means that whatever else you've got going on, you're, <laughs> I would expect that yes. you are a very a kind, loving person, probably oh. a nurturing kind of person, and that's in your genes. So that's a nice thing to, to know about yourself, I would say. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Excellent. Yeah. And so it's not all negative. That's the other thing I want to say. I mean, often we start with the high risk stuff because that's where there's area for improvement and that's what most people want they, they have problems and they want help but actually there's equally you can go through and look at all the low risk stuff and go look at all the the wonderful things that all the gifts that you have and i think that's really important too to focus on all the gifts that god or the universe or whatever you want to call it has given you too yeah and <laughs> it's funny because as you say this that's that would balance some of the other risks yeah so it's neat to see I think it absolutely does. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Look for the personality report. Okay. This actually, this actually tells you your level of like, whether you're extroverted or not, whether you're agreeable or not, whether you're conscientious or not. I expect conscientious, I would guess, given that your work schedule. Mm -hmm.